So I simply ask to call it x and y or input variable and output variable. But one of our focuses in this class over the next few weeks, uh, days rather, is going to be the residuals in the They're important. Any of you that go on to future work related to modeling and data analysis, data mining, principal component analysis, partial least squares, neural networks, Bayesian analysis, all of these terms that you might see floating around in your career in the future, all come down to understanding those residuals. Residuals are key in any data analysis. It's kind of seems unintuitive because really what we want for our model most times is we want these parameters be zero and be one, beta zero and beta, beta one. Okay, but to build the model and to understand that we have a good model it comes down to the residuals. And the reason is we want our residuals to only contain random error that we cannot account for. So we say our residuals should be simply random variation. There should be no unmodeled components in there. If we see the structure in our residuals, we know that our model is not sufficient. So simply trying to use an I squared value to judge our models is not going to be sufficient. We have to take a far more careful approach and really investigate those residuals important. Now, the other thing to really emphasize to you is that the residuals E there are the residuals related to the Y variable. What I mean by that is the following. Let me just erase all the boxes and rewrite it again. Y is beta 0 plus beta 1 x plus an error. Those residuals refer to the error here refers to the error's y. So what we've done is we've taken our y, our measurement, which we've taken off our process, and we've broken it down into two pieces. We've broken it into the part we can explain, and we've taken it out into the part that's left unexplained. Notice the unexplained portion refers to y. The part or the piece or the portion of y which we cannot explain. Those residuals are not residuals in x. The residuals are unexplained components of y alone. So they're unrelated to x. I'll come back to that point several times. And it's Now, when we derive our least squares model, there's, there's several ways one can go about it. We'll actually propose some options here in the case for us. But really, we're saying beta 0 and beta 1 are my parameters. So remember, parameters are variables that we don't know. These are population parameters. We don't know what beta 0 and beta 1 are. And our goal in this section of the course is to find estimates of those parameters. So we're going to essentially say, I'm going to estimate beta zero. So what I'll do often is call that E zero. That's going to be my estimate of beta zero. And my estimate of E one is going to be, uh, beta one is going to be E one. It's no different to what we did earlier. Earlier when we built confidence we said we have some unknown being u, and what we did was we estimated that x bar. So u was like a parameter, x bar was my statistic. Here in my picture, beta 0 is my parameter, and b 0 is my statistic. And in the same way, when we build confidence intervals for u, we build no confidence intervals for beta 0 and beta 1. Essentially, we want to be able to write, in a class of two from now, we're going to be able to write beta zero as some lower bound and some upper bound, and beta one as some lower bound and upper bound. This should just be in 
So we're going to find bounds for our two parameters, beta 0 and beta 1.
Okay, so the method we typically use is we say we minimize the sum of squares. Right? That's what you're that's how you've learned these squares, if I imagine, right? Your stats cost minimize the sum of squares in the residuals. Okay, so let's let's interpret that from the means it's straightforward. So you can take this data point over here, there's my residual distance EI. What we're saying is we're going to take all my EI values, those vertical residuals, square them take the summation of it. So if I've got 10 data points, sum up these 10 residual distances in the vertical direction, square them, square them first, so that you don't get cancellation of the errors. And then I'm going to sum them. I want to make this as small as possible. So this number then, we know is going to be greater than or equal to zero. It's going to be equal to zero if our data fits on our line exactly. But it's always going to be either zero in very, very limited cases or some large positive number. Now there's another way that you could find that line, this diagonal line. Some ways that people have proposed is to minimize this distance, the perpendicular distance to the line. So every data point, we can go calculate that perpendicular distance, square them, and sum them up. That will find you a P0 and a P1 as well. Not the same P0, not the same P1. But we'll find you a value of P0 and a value of P1 that might be suitable in the case. One other way that people do this is they give even more penalty to large residuals. So really, really penalize residuals quite strongly when they get to the power of four. What does that formula do? We're going to understand what that formula looks like that geometrically and then the I just that first one is what the standard these squares projected is. The second one penalizes errors Really, really heavily. Now, one thing I want you to start to think about is you've always seen regression with a picture that looks something like this. Beautiful data with no outliers. Okay? But the data you're going to deal with in reality will have outliers. What if those are your data over there? But then on your xy axis, so let's just take this, this is my x axis over here. What if your x axis has a data point that's out here? What is the regression slope and intercept going to look like if you're minimizing the sum of squares of the residual? is 
any guesses? Any other? Sorry, well, it's Numbers, but you're starting to think how I want you to, to approach this problem is that you can find <coughs> slopes there that look something almost like that, where your slope is totally the wrong sign. The reason is because if this model is trying to minimize the sum of the residuals, this point is out here, and these residual distances, when summed and squared, are going to be smaller than the residual distance any other way. Okay. So for extreme outliers, you'll get totally the wrong information, the wrong slope, and the wrong intercept being developed. You'll get a great R squared. Okay. So we have to have methods somehow that are less sensitive to outliers, and that's what benefit five does. And the five says, why don't I take the residuals and find the medium residual and minimize the sum of medium residual squared? That's going to say that my model is not going to be biased by Why we see it so so widely used 
given that context, then you really should understand these squares models really well. The other reason why we need to understand it really well is because the least squares model in pretty much every aspect of data mining that I've seen will always be there in some sense. So for may have heard me talk about partial least squares, PLS, or PCA, principal component analysis, or multivariate data analysis. All of these methods build on the least squares model. Underneath them there is a least squares model there. So if in the future you go ahead and study and learn about these methods, you need a solid understanding of these squares as well. So let's take a look at how we develop an least squares model. Who's taking 4G? Most of you, okay. Unconstrained optimization problems. So no constraints, convex optimization objective. Those terms mean anything? They do, I know they do, because I know Sam is teaching them to you. So convex optimization, unconstrained. What do we know about convex unconstrained optimization problems? And there's 
only one value of the, of the slope, E1, which minimizes the objective function. So notice that as I start to move away from the minimum, the objective function rises very rapidly. So if I use the smaller value of the slope, or if I use a larger value of the slope, I get a much, much larger objective function. If you want to look at it in two dimensions, the objective function is a 2D ball, and we're saying we find that minimum in the ball, that point over there corresponds to some value of E0, and it corresponds to some value of E1. Any other values of E0 and E1 will have an objective function much higher up in the ball. So that ball shape is essentially a drawing of what the objective function looks like. If you plot your objective function in 2D, which we can easily do for these space problems, you're simply finding the point at the bottom of the ball. Now that's obviously very crude. We don't go and draw pictures like this to go find where E0 and E1 are. We use a little bit more sophisticated tools to do that, and we use the method of finding the derivative of the objective function with respect to the search variable. So, have you covered this in optimization yet? No? Okay, so you guys are, are a little, are we going to get there? For sure you're going to get there. When you take the first derivative of the objective function with respect to your search variable, so in other words, with respect to E0 and E1, set that derivative equal to zero, and you solve that equation, that equation solution is the solution to the optimization problem. So what you get in fact is there's your, no there's your nonlinear function, take the objective with respect to E0, that gets you one equation. Take the objective function, derivative with respect to E1, that gets you a second equation. So you have two equations now, two unknowns, your unknowns are E0 and E1. Solve those two equations and you get your optimum. That's, in fact, how we solve these problems in practice. So, there they are. There's the objective functions derivative with respect to E0. And the second line is the objective function of that, that object, uh, is the objective function derivative with respect to E1. And if we set that equal to 0, solve two equations and two unknowns with a little bit of mathematical manipulation, you get the equations for E0 and E1. We get very, very simplified equations. And this is where I want to just take a little bit of time and show you how to interpret these two equations. There's a lot of meaning in those two lines over there, and a good skill is to be able to interpret that over and express what it says. Take a look at the first what are x bar and y bar? What are x bar and y bar? The means, okay? They're the means of our raw data. So when you develop your experiment model, you have your x i values, you have your y i values. You have a table of numbers, table of numbers, and then at the bottom you calculate x bar and y bar. Those are your two means of your raw data. If you want your data set, so you go with your regression model, then it will be zero to intercept, v1 is the slope. X bar and Y bar represents the mean, the mean of your X data. So if there's my X data, the mean is going to be somewhere in between. Now my mean is, let's say, that focal point. It's not an actual data point. You didn't have a data point in your raw data that happened to correspond to X bar. But X bar and Y bar are both numbers that you can go calculate and you can go locate it on that plot. <coughs> what the first equation tells you is that the regression model will pass through the line where x bar and y bar lies. So if you go recalculate x bar and y bar, 
draw it, it's going to guarantee fall right on the regression line. The slope and the intersection right from your least squares model, the mean of x, the mean of y will march. So what that essentially is telling you, it's sort of like a pivot point. So there's x bar, here's y bar, there your least squares models be centered about that. And that point will be right on the regression line. What do you notice if anything that you pick up on the second equation from E1? Let's take a look at the equation of E1. Anything that you notice about that? Is Algebraically, 
that might be a good situation <coughs> for What we're simply saying is that the numerator there represents the correlation between x and y. And if the two vectors are correlated, what are they doing? They're pointing in the same direction. Right, so two vectors that are correlated and pointing in the same direction, what's the angle between them? Okay, zero degrees. The cosine of e equal to zero is one. That's the maximum correlation that's possible. So some people like to see this analytically. Other people can visualize this geometrically. The cosine loop over there is a link between the analytical world and the geometric world. And that's why I want to talk about it. For those who like to see it. Let's take a look at that denominator. I said there's a lot to discuss about this formula, so we're still not moving away from it. One more thing, the denominator. What can go wrong with the denominator?
just kind of hinting that this is going to come to the class to now when I make x bar and y bar equal to zero. So that essentially this is the end. Okay, there's a few other, uh, other points there, three and four, which really don't um, matter just yet. Um, especially, I'll wait until we get rid of the deviation form and then we'll come back and talk a bit about those. Again, for those of you that have a more analytical uh, inclination, you can see that x transpose y is saying what's the angle between x and the residuals? The angle there is 90 degrees. What's the angle between y and the residual? That angle is zero. So if you want to draw a picture of this system in your mind, those are the angles that you need to be aware of. And the last thing I want to just point out is this fifth point over here is notice that you want to calculate B0 the first E one okay, So those who say then the estimates of B0 and B1 are correlated. You can't calculate one without the other. Okay, so any error that you have in B1, that error is populated from the calculation of B0. Okay, so that's Third point, how could this denominator blow up when it's equal to zero? It means that as long as we've got variation in our x data, we will obtain a solution. That means, simply means as long as your x data has some scatter and not all identically the same value, you will always get a solution. Now, you would obviously notice the moment you open Excel or R, all your x values are the same number that you need to say stop or something. So that's the only case B squares that ever fails. Any other time, no matter what the data, you will always get a solution for B0. You will always get a solution for B1. Now, just in the last uh, two minutes here, just to point, point the way forward for you as you go through the software tutorials on the course website, I'd just like to load two data sets here, x and y. So two vectors, x and y. But I want to point out the function R that you're going to learn to use quite a bit, and that's LM. So LM is the function in R that you build for the squares model for you. LM stands for linear model. And the notation is fairly strange, it seems. LM curly, so that tilde is the key that's on your keyboard next to the one character, just to the left of the one of your standard keyboard. So it simply says, build me a model of y which is described by x. That's how you interpret that character until it as described by. So give me a model that will predict y as described by x. That's how you should read that. We're going to build on that in future class for you to start to say, build me a model as described by x1 plus x2 plus x3 raised to the power 1.5. Okay, so you can expand that later on. But for now, we've simply got two variables. So building a model y as it's described by variable x. And the output that you get is the intercept of 3 in this case and the slope of 0.5. We're going to talk about that next class. Now the only other thing I want to talk about quick is the summary. So once you build the model, you can say summary for the linear model of y as described by x. So if you give that model to the summary function, you're going to get this output that's fairly extensive, which will give you a whole lot of information. We're going to learn how to interpret in the next few classes. We're going to see some of the residuals, we're going to see the standard errors, t values. R squared, multiply squared, the reason we can learn, and so we're going to learn what those mean and how to learn.